So we are in the printing workshop at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Steve, could you tell us what is a broadside? Yep, I could. Well, a broadside is, is basically just a, a single sheet. Doesn't sound very interesting, but it's just a single sheet of printing sort of like mm -hmm. this. Um, because the, the basic point about it is because it's a single sheet, it's very easy to print. So any, in effect, any printer can do this kind of thing. You don't have to be sophisticated, don't have to have good equipment. And they were printed and sold very cheaply for the ordinary people. They were the original um, mass market, uh, mass media, printed on one side only, again, because that's, that's all they could do very thin cheap paper this is from uh, about the 1850s and you you can probably hear it, it rustling uh, so they were cheap ways of printing things for the masses literally sold for a penny or a halfpenny half a pence um, and often as we'll say in a minute with songs on and with pictures so that's a broadside Okay, so can you tell us a bit about printing then? Well, the, the printing press arrived in England about uh, 1460s, you know, William Caxton you probably heard of. Yes. Um, and at that time it was the new technology. It was, you know, brand new from the continent. It was a big thing, a printing press. So but prior to that, how, if you wanted something written, how would you...? Uh, well, everything was manuscripts. Everything was literally handwritten. Um, or hand copied. So you could actually buy books, but they would be hand right, <laughs> handwritten so. books. So only the rich yeah. and only the, the wealthy um, and the educated could buy them. And they're the only ones that could read them anyway. Mm. Nobody else could. Yeah. Um, so this, if you like, is the start of mass literacy, mass printing. So printing comes here about 1460s, 1470s, but by 15 hundred at least we know that by the you know early 16th century they were printing songs ballads broadside broadside ballads as we're going to be talking about mm -hmm. in, a, in a minute so right back to that time as soon as they start printing what are we going to print oh there's religious things there's you know a bit of politics there's proclamations from the king about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do oh and let's have some songs as well so that's when your broadside ballads were born is when they saw the market basically for, I mean, ballads go back a lot longer than that, mm. you know, oral tradition. But from that moment on, you could print a ballad and sell it to people. Wow. And can you tell us a bit about the different uh, ways that broadsides were made, sizes, um, that, uh, as we can see from that one, there are some pictures. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the pictures were a, a very important part of the broadside trade. We, we should say, of course, that when, you know, from, from 1500 to the mid 19th century, so for a good sort of you know three, four hundred years, printing itself doesn't change a lot. It's still the hand presses, which you can see around us here, and we'll have some pictures of them, um, whereby each page is printed individually right. so you do a hundred copies of page one if you're doing a book and then a hundred copies of page two and so on right so all compared to today's techniques it's oh. still a sort of a, you know a, a really sort of time oh very very time consuming <laughs> you have to set your type handmade. yep you have to set your type paper was handmade mm. until about 1800 it, you had to make your own ink you right. know right so all of it was very time consuming and that's why if you like a single sheet a broadside is economically a sensible thing to do because you can do that one sheet quite quickly whereas if you're doing a book it would take you weeks don't get your money back for weeks mm -hmm. with the broadside you can print it and sell it on the street the next day broadsides come in all sorts of shapes and sizes but there were um, standard sizes depending on the, the paper makers the paper makers would make them of a particular size and that's, you know, so your broadside would end up that, that sort of size. 
There were big ones, there were smaller ones. But the one that I just showed you, which is a 19th century one, that was the standard size in throughout the 19th century. Um, and remember that literacy wasn't, um, you know, very... Yes, I, I wanted to ask about literacy. How, how, how could these ballads have worked if, uh, you know, most of the people that were buying them couldn't read? Yeah, this is, I mean, obviously... Or presumably it they couldn't read, maybe. Well, it changes over time, of course. Back, mm. back in the 15th, 16th century, not many people mm. could read. By the 19th century, there's always somebody around who could, can read. And we know that these, were, especially in the 17th century and, you know, a bit before that, people bought these and stuck them on the wall of an alehouse or a barber shop or something, so they were decorative. And you only need one person to be able to read in the community because they read them out. And this, we know this happened. One person would buy a ballad. They'd read it to everybody else in the pub or in the wherever uh, at the marketplace and everybody would learn it by ear. Mm. So even though it starts off on, in print, it becomes oral tradition because mm. people read them out loud. Mm. Is there any, um, I suppose it's probably hard to ascertain, but are there any examples of it sort of already being in oral culture and then going into print. Yeah, there, there is there's some evidence, but very little. It's right. n the basic pattern over time, certainly by the 19th century, which is when most of your folk songs were being written, what we now regard as folk songs, most of those were actually written by broadside writers. They were paid a shilling for a song, which, I mean, that was a, you know, that was a reasonable sum. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they weren't oral into print, they were print first and then into the oral tradition. Mm. But of course, once the song is printed and circulated, as soon as you learn it and start singing it, it's mm. back in the oral tradition. Mm. So one broadside could be sung, you know, ballad could be learnt by 20 people. Mm. And those 20 people sing it to the next 20 people. Mm. So. The print and the oral aren't um, completely separate. They're intertwined. Mm -hmm. Just wondering a little bit more about the pictures. Initially, were they woodcuts? Yes. Um, right up until the 19th century, they literally were uh, etched onto a piece of wood, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that you, you got the picture, in effect, standing out on, on, the, on the wood would in block relief. Yeah. in relief that's the word thank you <laughs> and uh, that then gets set in the type so you set up your letters to make your words and then you put the wood block in there as well well put it in your printing press and take your the impression so they were wooden literally made of wood they were you had to have a lot of skill to make good ones mm. i mean there are some very famous um, wood engravers and woodcutters, one called B Bewick, Buick, I think is how you pronounce it, from Newcastle, um, who could do very fine um, artwork just cutting into, into the wood. But most of the broadside printers, because they were only selling these things for a penny, you know, they, they couldn't spend a week doing each picture. Um, they were much cruder than that. Can you tell us a bit more about how they would have been sold? Yeah, you, you could buy broadsides in various places. You could buy them at the printer's offices, the printer's shop, and you could buy them in um, stationers and toy shops and stuff, and village shops would sell a few and so on. But the main way they were sold is in the street, quite literally, which is why they're called street literature. Uh, Somebody would buy, say, a dozen copies from the printer at a discount, and then they would walk around the streets literally singing the song um, and attracting a, you know, attracting a crowd, singing the song and then selling them to the crowd. Or they would do what's called pinning up, which means they would have a range of songs and they would literally pin them on the wall and you could come along and choose which one you wanted. So there are lots of paintings of people doing this, as one called uh, a love song, where this servant girl is saying to the seller, have you got a new love song to sell me? Um, 
So this is um, its very direct way of selling, you know, to the people direct um, in the streets. But one of the key things is that that's how you got the tune. Right. Because as you may have noticed already, the broadsides very, very rarely have the tune. Now, sometimes they'll say to the tune of, so it gives you a clue. But most of the time you learn the tune from the broadside seller. Mm. So if you're selling the broadsides, and before I give you my penny or halfpenny, you sing me the song. You don't have to sing the whole thing. You sing the first couple of verses. Oh yeah, that's the tune. I know that tune, fine. Or it's a new tune. I'll, I'll listen while you sing it to the next person. Mm. So one of the reasons why the police didn't like broadside sellers <laughs> is they gathered a crowd around them while they're singing the song. <clears throat> and of course the pickpockets liked these crowds. So the broadside sellers would sometimes be in league with the pickpockets. I'll gather a oh, crowd goodness. while you go and work the crowd because they're all paying attention. Okay. And there are lots of um, newspaper articles and bits in books where people living in cities would say to their servants, you know, they forbade them. They said, do not linger in the street if there's a broadside seller, oh, you wow. know, because that's not only is it wasting the servant's time, but uh, they would be they would be the prey to pickpockets. Now, not everybody, not every broadside seller was a crook. I'm not saying that, but that was the um, idea at the time. So, what are the different themes and types of song that would be committed to a broadside? Well, again, it changes over time um, to a certain extent because if you think about the 17th century when the you know the civil wars were going on and the arguments between the Puritans and the Royalists. Uh, a lot of the songs at that time were um, political and were religious because a lot of the arguments between the you know the, the different sides would be played out in songs or poems set to set to music because that was the way to get to the people. There were no newspapers. You know, so the way to get things to the people would be, or well, one of the ways is through broadside ballads. So these precursors to newspapers? Oh yes, yes, certainly the early and earlier broadsides um, had some of the functions of a newspaper. Um, but as time goes on, they're more your sort of tabloid newspaper than they are the Times. They start off as the Times and they end up as the Sun or the Star. Um, but by the 19th century, which is really the heyday for broadside ballads, that's when thousands and thousands were being printed. Um, they, they were the pop songs of the day, um, written about, you know, their love songs, or they're about the Navy, about battles going on, about, or, or about both, you know, a, a lament by a young girl because as, Boyfriend has been press ganged and that that mm. kind of thing. So all the things that you would expect pop songs to be about. Mm. But Broadside also had, in effect, fake news. They loved celebrity scandals, gossip, you know, gossip about you know, about the royal family. You know, who'd have thought it? About what Prince the Prince of Wales was up to at the time. Um, all of that sort of thing was involved, um, and. Obviously, at different times, when there was a war on, you had a lot of patriotic songs. Mm. You know, um, when there wasn't a war on, you didn't. You know. mm. One of the really popular things was last dying speeches of <laughs> executed criminal, well, criminals yes. about to be executed. Up to 1868, we still had public hanging in this country. So a hanging, an execution, was a major media event. Yes. Everybody yes. came, everybody went. Um, and had a good time. And the ballad printers, they had covered the trial of any, any crime that went on. You know, if there was a murder, they would have a broadside about the murder and then a broadside about how they were hunting for the killer. And then when the killer was found, they'd have a broadside about the killer being found. And then right at the end, they'd have a broadside about the killer's last dying words. 
usually written by somebody else, of course, for a yes, shilling. Yes, yes, um, as but, the killer. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And those words, those broadsides were sold at the execution, literally, to the crowd. Well, why not? You've got a crowd, so you're going to sell your songs. So as soon as the drop was... <laughs> um, tr the, the trap door was pulled, as it were, and the, the hanging person was literally hanged rather than hung, they would start selling these last dying speeches. They never did it before oh, really? the drop. They did it as soon as the, you know, everybody roared and then you could buy the last dying speech. And these ballads give you a different window to the history books. They're history from below. They're what, what were the poor people? What were the ordinary people? What was I singing in 1820 or 1850 or whatever? Now, we, we, you can't say that they're that it's direct evidence because the songs weren't necessarily written by the servants or the milkmaids or the ploughboys, but they were written by lower class people, if you like, and they were written for lower class mm. people. That was the audience. So the people bought these things. They spent their hard earned money on this particular song as opposed to some other activity. Then it meant something to them. So to me as a historian, and, and I think in the same way to you as an artist, it gives us a, that little window into the past that we can't get from, from any, other, mm. um, any other source. Yeah. Because most other sources are about the, the rich people and the posh people and the literate people. Mm. They're about the generals rather than the soldiers. You know, they're about the, the um, lord and lady so-and-so rather than the dairy maid. <laughs> so, that's, that's why I like the broadside mm. ballads, and I think it's probably the same for an artist. I think it is, and I think um, what's quite striking often is how uh, similar, similar the gripes images. were yeah, right. to what they are now, to, you know, it, they have, you know, a different century's language and references, um, but actually, the fundamentals, uh, you know, the emotional traumas, the stories, the adventures are so uh, similar to anything yeah. that, yes. that, that people do go through now. And that, I think that's often the quite striking thing. Um, people often ask when you sing folk songs, you know, is it relevant? It's just like, well, you know, is anything relevant then over, you know, that, that, that we, we, you know, we perform Shakespeare, we, we listen to Beethoven, why, you know, why is yeah. that relevant? Why do you even ask if it's relevant? That's right. that's it's a bizarre question, question, but you question. do get asked that a lot. And it's, um, yeah. you know, that's quite one, one of the striking things for me is, um, yeah, the, the humanity that comes through in a lot of them yeah. when you sift you know, the, the, the sort of perhaps floral language or the, you know, the, the sort of historic well, exactly, stuff. Yeah, but yeah. that's lovely too, to me. I, I really love that yeah. too.